when it comes to linebacker and the Buffalo Bills last season, you look at a pleasant surprise, but yet a horrible loss. And then that pleasant surprise is gone when you need them the most. Welcome to the Buffalo End Zone Podcast, everyone. I'm Kevin Carroll. And I'm John Scott. Maybe next to tight end, our quickest pod is upcoming here because the linebacker position, once again, pretty stacked up, pretty solidified, pretty cheap, pretty young. Yep. There are some additions to backfill, but... The core of it is there. Really, the the starting off point is Matt Milano's health, his recovery from a season-ending injury, and if that forces the Bills to make any sort of a move as almost an insurance policy, should he run into issues returning from this injury that would prevent him from being ready for the start of the regular season? Yeah, for some reason, I was... Milano was a knee injury. For some reason, I was thinking it was an Achilles injury, which I know it's not. But Milano's health is going to be a big deal. He's such a key part of this offense. Though, John, my big thing is get him healthy and then, like, not this time, but, you know, during last offseason, the whole thing was who takes over for Tremaine Edmonds. And now Terrell Bernard has done more and exceed expectations at that position. So when you talk about we can probably go through this real quick, it is Matt Milano's health. It is health at the position and maybe getting some bodies in, like you said, as insurance policies or backups to come in, and you don't have to break the bank on bringing someone in. But, I mean, my goodness, if this unit was healthy or stays healthy or could be healthy going into next season – like, you're locked in with Matt Milano and Terrell Bernard. Which is great. Yeah. If if healthy, Bernard was sensational in his first year. Milano was probably trending again towards a f- conversation for All-Pro. Bernard, I think, was part of a conversation for All-Pro, even though he didn't really receive as many votes as I think he should have. Does Milano have to factor in at all in terms of a restructure or anything like that. He's carrying a 12.4 plus million dollar cap hit. I don't know. Maybe. I mean, I just look at the the top contracts on the team and he's up there. He's one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh, seventh highest cap hit on the team. So if you're looking to save some money, which the bills need to do, he could be, but he's not going anywhere. It sounds like he's in a good spot with his rehab. There's really no concern that I sensed that he would not be ready for training camp or whatever. They'll slow play it. Don't imagine he'll do a whole heck of a lot. OTA's mini camp. That's usually how they play it with these guys coming back. Mm -hmm. But there you are. And then you have Dorian Williams, a pick I was very critical of when they made it this past year as a third round linebacker. He's now kind of your swing guy. He's the one that, all right, if something happens to Matt Milano, he can go and play on the outside. If something happens to Terrell Bernard, he can play on the inside. He wasn't at that point. That was a big criticism of McDermott by some for the Kansas City loss, was watching A.J. Klein out there and saying, why is the third-round rookie who's athletic not on the field as the team's getting eviscerated by Travis Kelsey and others in the middle of the field? I just don't think he was ready from an understanding and development for communicating the defense as a whole. I mean, that's a big responsibility that is not sexy or fun to talk about from a fan standpoint, but from a football standpoint, it matters greatly, and I just don't think he was ready, and that's why he didn't see the field. On top of just even when he played on the outside, when they were trying to figure out what to do immediately after the Milano injury, he was making a lot of mistakes then as well. I don't think... In any way, shape, or form, when Dorian Williams was drafted, you could envision all that happened on the Bills side of the defense. You got a kid and coming out of Tulane. I mean, you can say what you want about programs kids come out of. It's not like he's coming out of an Alabama or a Michigan or something like that. I expected growing pains with him. 
I know the team had talked about his versatility when they drafted him, that he could do both. I even think when they started mini camps and stuff, he was doing both the entire time. Um, an unfortunate situation there, but yeah, the AJ Klein thing, you would have thought that by that time, by the time they got to the postseason, he would have been in a better spot to been able to take over that role, but it just wasn't the case. They were more comfortable with Balen Spector, who's a guy who's been in the system a little bit to play, and then obviously he got hurt as well. That's kind of the linebacker spot was the one that was most important facing the Kansas City Chiefs, the one that was also the most depleted facing mm-hmm. the Kansas City Chiefs. So Milano's back, but coming off an injury, Terrell Bernard, Dorian Williams, Balen Spector, and that's it. That's all you have out of the room. They're two free agents, Tyler Medikevich, who's been a special teams mainstay for mm-hmm. years and then let's have the Tyrell Dodson conversation spot track has his market value at about um, just under five million per year with Milano back Bernard there Dorian Williams th- there's no path honestly even at two million dollars for Tyrell Dodson to come back to this team would you agree I would agree I like what Tyrell Dodson did for the team this year um but I, I agree with what you're saying. There's no room for him right now on this. It would be nice to have him uh, for someone familiar with the system who has been here for a while. But, um, I mean, who knows with Medikevich. Every year I think he comes back, right? <laughs> I mean, do you think he should come back? This is another one of these when we're talking through training camp and doing out mock 53-man rosters, people are beside themselves when you put certain players on for special teams reasons. And well, I, know I was going to say that. I know it's it's been a highly critical topic for the roster construction at times of, it seems, now I don't, I don't pay attention closely enough to the 53-man roster of every team in the National Football League, but I know fans – some of them believe the Bills put more emphasis and focus on special teams only guys than other teams around the league. Medikevich certainly the poster child for that. Special teams wasn't that special no. this year for the Bills. Um Medikevich always seems to stand out to me on special teams, like he's always around the ball. You know, I don't think He's going to cost a ton, so if he's there, I'm assuming he's probably back. I mean, maybe they sign him, and then it's another camp decision. Wouldn't you just see where that goes? Because, again, they only got four linebackers on the roster. You expect Dodson to be gone. So this is where, again, I don't see any sort of substantial investment free agency. I don't see any substantial investment in the draft. I think maybe it's another, all right, Bale Inspector was, I think, a sixth or seventh round pick. That's kind of where you're looking at, all right, cheap, maybe vet min type linebackers to round out the group. Mm -hmm. You flood it with some talent, let them compete, and maybe this is just where the conversation going to the back end of camp amplifies of, all right, are they keeping five, they keeping six, and who's the maybe new guy that they're choosing to roll with as opposed to the the set-it-forget-it kind of core that they've had now for a few years. And I totally see that happening with this unit. Good job. I think we nailed this one. <laughs> we got we got a lot on the bone, though, to round out the position outlooks for this offseason for the Bills because we're, we're finishing up with the secondary. And there's obviously a lot of uncertainty with big names who've been there for a long time. And it's going to be a, a heck of a way to end our position-by-position position offseason outlook. And if you want to catch any of these previous episodes – whether audio-only version, YouTube. We started at quarterback and have gone all the way through every single position, some longer than others because some have more of a talking point here. And with any of this, Kevin, especially the YouTube page, subscribe, drop your comments, tell Kevin how stupid he is, how awesome and smart I am, and uh, we'll really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us, everyone. (laughs) 